Welcome to the third and final part of our lecture on the uh, films, the media of uh, John Acumphra. Now in this part, I would just like to turn our attention to a more recent work of John Acumphra that builds on, I think, some of the things that we've been talking about uh, in regard to uh, his previous films like Hansworth Songs, The Last Angel of History, and of course, The Nine Muses. This would be his 2015 um, in installation, uh, Vertigo C, which is a three-screen um, installation, a monumental, uh, large three-screen installation um, that is constructed from, um, in part, uh, images of the ocean taken from the BBC's uh, Natural History uh, Archive. Uh, has many images of oceans uh, taken from, you know, uh, uh, below water as well as above the depths of the ocean to the top. And in part, the film is is a kind of um, monumental rethinking or reimagining of uh, the ocean through the lens of the um, the transatlantic slave trade, which ran from approximately the uh, 16th, uh, the late 15th, 16th century to the uh, 19th century for a period of 350 to 400 years. And in some ways, the film is a sort of reimagining of this, you know, epic uh, story, this epic tragedy, uh, its, uh, um, its lingering effects on the ocean in light of, on, this, on the other hand, in light of uh, contemporary 21st century uh, migrant crises in the Atlantic Ocean, the movement of bodies, uh, throughout the um, Atlantic Ocean, as people are fle fleeing, among other things, uh, political uh, persecution, um, war, as well as environmental catastrophe. And so all of this is kind of brought together in uh, Acumphra's Vertigo Sea and its uh, three screen uh, installation. Here we just see here another three set of three images. Uh, two, of course, of these images, for example, are taken from the BBC Natural History Archives of the Ocean. And then on the left, we also have um, the sort of uh, the image of a bound uh, hand, uh, so of course, telling us about the transatlantic slave trade and the movement of peoples across the um, so-called Middle Passage as part of this uh, forced migration of peoples. That is another sort of central component of Acumphra's work. And so we could think about uh, um, Vertigo C in terms of this logic of, of the haunting or of the ghost. And we can think of it as a kind of haunted monument, right? And so among the things that we need to bear in mind when considering Vertigo C is the, of course, as the aforementioned monumentality, uh, the size, the or perhaps even overwhelming nature of the three screen installation as a virtue of these three different screens playing simultaneously in which the trans transatlantic slave trade meets the contemporary migration crisis, we have a logic of juxtaposition. And related to all of this, we have again ghostliness, which is to say the haunting of the present of what is visible to us uh, by the invisible, the haunting of the present by the past. But then of course, on the flip side, we also have the past as sort of seen through the lens of the present, right? So we have these this sort of the timeline, as it were, of the film is, is, is extending in both directions. It's extending uh, from the past to the present, but as well uh, equally from the present into the past. And so we have then, we are between multiple histories, and we are also between history and the natural history of the ocean and aquatic life. And all of this is uh, concatenated together into a realm of experience, a viewing experience, for example, for us as viewers of the film, sitting in an art gallery, perhaps watching Vertigo C, is, is an experience that challenges any one easily or conventionally established sense of space and time. And so Acumphra has written, um, this is not about Vertigo C specifically, but about his work and the concept of the ghost. And I think it is apropos to, re to thinking about his larger oeuvre as well as uh, Vertigo C specifically. And he has said, quote, ghosts made sense because our very existence was organized around this doubling. Ghosts were the only indication we had that we inhabited both the deep interior as well as the farthest marginalia of the available national narratives, the national narratives of Britain in this case. So part of our project 
became one of articulating this cognitive distance, this being in between, this unusual perceptual positioning that allowed you to be both foreigner and citizen at the same time. In the absence of the monument, in the absence of tangible fragments, diasporic artists face a monumental task. They are forced to connect with the question of memory, with the question of the ghost, with the question of the intangible. It is through these that the artist discovers the monumental, discovers the ways in which they are located in their culture and in their present. So how does this three-screen installation produce this sense of locatedness, this complicated sense of locatedness, precisely through this sense of simultaneity, of juxtaposition, and as it were, locatedness as betweenness, a monument to a feeling of betweenness. Let us take a look at uh, just a fragment from a uh, documentation of Vertigo C. So you will, of course, noted the presence, uh, again, of the so-called Rukin figure, the figure of the wanderer with 
uh, their back uh, to the viewer, right, looking off into the distance. We see that, of course, again in Vertigo C, as we did uh, in uh, The Nine Muses, as well as, in fact, a number of other accompanying films. And what we now see here is another uh, one of the um, images that would have been in one of the three screens uh, of a um, 19th century um, another uh, of a 19th century figure, but in this case it is a, a, uh, uh, a, a black person wearing the 19th century clothing. And, and what we are in part getting here in this one image of this, another kind of uh, image of the, as it were, melancholy observer that we recall from Herzog is the um, Acumfra um, reminding us as viewers that race and colonization um, are significant and indeed central parts of modernity, right? That period from the 15th or 16th century to the present, the period of what we now call modernity and this process of modernization, the creation of modern nation states, of modern Europe, of modern Britain, um, more specifically, that race, colonization, and empire are, are in fact, need to be re-understood as central aspects, indeed key aspects, of the creation of the modern world as we know it. And so when we can rethink this figure of the uh, melancholy observer, not simply in the Eurocentric terms of the wanderer, uh, perhaps that we may think of with Werner Herzog drawing on the tradition of Caspar David Friedrich that we see on the left, but also perhaps again the wanderer, the melancholy observer uh, from the point of view of the migrant. And that makes us reconceptualize how we think of landscape, modernity, nation, belonging, community, and identity. And so this then will take us to our questions and discussion. So first, um, I would like for us to consider the function of montage and collage in one of John Acumfra's films. We could look at, for example, Hands With Songs, the clip from The Last Angel of History, or The Nine Muses. What is the relationship between the juxtaposition and collision of images and sounds that are appropriated or found in the archive in Acumfra's films? How, does these, how do these collisions and juxtapositions produce meaning or deconstruct uh, the given meaning? that was um, previously established. What revision of community or um, of modern Britain does a comfort's montage or collage of archival images produce? What is the significance of the themes and techniques of the monument and of migration in a comfort's montage of images? Right, we can think of migration as both a theme, for example, as well as a technique in the way that a comfort approaches archival images. Second, Consider Acumfra's poetic documentary vision of the landscape in the Nine Muses. How does he aesthetically position the natural Arctic landscapes represented in the Nine Muses in relationship to the images of post-war urban England taken from the archive? Those images, for example, of the first um, uh, migrants, Afro-Caribbean migrants in London from 1948 and the early 1950s that we see uh, used in the film. What is the role of voiceover narration vis-a-vis -vis images of the landscape in the film? And we can think of voiceover narration in terms of the fragments of poetry that we hear in the film, as well as the audio testimony of various uh, Black British or South Asian people that we hear in the film, as well as uh, any other examples that we may think of. What is their relationship to images of the landscape? Third, compare a comfort's poetics of migration to Werner Herzog's quest for the sublime as we um, uh, understood it last week. What do Acumfra's conceptions of the monument, the ghost, and what he calls ontological transience, for example, share with Herzog's notions of ecstatic truth or inner landscapes? How is Acumfra's diasporic vision of a world in flux in the Nine Muses different from Herzog's melancholy observer in a film like Lessons of Darkness? I look forward to hearing your thoughts, perhaps, on this, uh, on this question in particular. And finally, you could choose to discuss the significance of tradition, the canon, myth, poetry, etc., for a comfra. How are canonical texts, canonical British texts from Shakespeare and Milton and so forth, at once embraced and critically appropriated by a comfra in the Nine Muses? What does a comfra's appropriation of canonical texts and images mean in relationship to his film's challenge to traditional forms 
of documentary representation. So I look forward to uh, discussing all of this with you in our uh, synchronous chat as well as on uh, uh, Canvas. Thank you.